What happens when we create machines that are as or more intelligent than we are? What are the possible timelines, implications, and ways forward to ensure the most positive future for our world? In this first sequence on timelines, we're looking at how these machines might be built and when that might happen. In later episodes, we'll dig more deeply into the implications of AGI and how we can ensure they benefit our world. This is the AGI Show, and I'm your host, Sarush Paul. Today on the show, we have with us Alex Brown, who you'll remember from episode two. As I mentioned in that particular episode, Alex is one of the most talented software engineers I've ever had the pleasure of working with. And for the last couple of years, he's been focused entirely on ML and data projects, including working closely with large language models like GPT-3, including to create products for companies like Google. We have Alex back on the show because actually in the last four months, so since since episode two, um, Alex has seen enough new, he reached out and said, you know, I've seen enough new impressive developments in the world of, of state-of-the-art artificial intelligence that we wanted to have a conversation about these developments and also to share kind of how those developments have updated his timeline towards AGI and we can have a, a really good conversation about that. So without further ado, um, let's get into it. Um, welcome, Alex. It's great to have you on the show again. Yeah, great to be back. And, and thanks again for the kind words. Absolutely. Absolutely. So um, let's start with just a little bit of an overview, Alex. Um, what kinds of developments have you seen these last four months in the world of AI? And how have they affected your view of AGI timelines? Yeah, so just to quickly summarize, uh, I mean, GPT-4 was released. Uh, and right after that, there was a slew of research papers uh, exploring its capabilities and revealing some really emergent behaviors. Uh, so things like tool use and reflection. Um, there's also uh, Palm E, which is a, a project from Google, and they published a paper about it fairly recently where they took a large language model and gave it uh, embodiment. So hooked it up to a robot and gave it the ability to do certain tasks. Uh, so I think there's just been a lot of developments that I found pretty surprising. Uh, and at the same time, some of the barriers that I had anticipated are, are looking like they might not be such a big deal after all. Um, so, yeah. Fantastic. And um, maybe let's just talk quickly about those barriers. Just what are some of those barriers that you're talking about that you were, were you expecting to be there that have that have kind of been toppled or or made progress on? Yeah, absolutely. So the last time that we spoke, um, I mentioned the possibility of hardware being a barrier. Um, it really looks like that is not the case uh, so far. Uh, OpenAI has been pretty secretive about what exactly is uh, what what hardware exactly is powering gpt4 but it looks like it it hasn't been a problem and uh, ha happy to dig into that in a little bit more detail um another thing that i predicted was that uh gpt3 was a model that was uh, only designed for ingesting text and it, it can't process uh, images or audio um, I guess I knew at the time that there was a possibility to change the underlying architecture to accept new types of inputs, but I underestimated how easy that would be, uh, apparently, and how quickly we would start to see those kinds of models. So GPT-4 already is capable of ingesting images. And then uh, Palm-E, which I mentioned, uh, can also ingest uh, visual data and, and uh, is a little bit more multimodal than what we've seen in the past. Yes, so the Palm-E does is more spatial planning and, and spatial perception type, type ingestion, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, and then one other thing that I probably underestimated is I, I said that um, I thought that models like GPT-3 would not really be a direct stepping stone towards uh, AGI. Uh, maybe they would be a part of some future AGI system, a part that's really good at processing language, for example. And my perspective is starting to shift on that a little bit too. Um, it looks like there's some capacity for uh, GPT-4 and ChatGPT to 
be like the main uh, autonomous agent and the main uh, pilot for uh, primitive AGI systems, which I thought was really surprising and it was kind of uh, counter to what I expected. Yeah, yeah, and we'll talk about that in a bit more detail in terms of what we've seen. But yes, you're right. People are have started using LLMs as more of the the the, the brains and connecting it up to other types of input and output. So, you know, make me a website where, you know, we'll, we'll write code one bit and deploy a little bit and, 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 and um, ask questions of the user another for. So it's essentially it's becoming the orchestrating brains behind a lot of the agent type behaviors that we, we would expect to see in an AGI. Yeah, yeah, it's just, just on the cusp of starting to show uh, the potential for that kind of thing, for sure. Yeah, uh, yeah, and that did I'm, seem to be some of some of the where a lot of the improvements were between GPT three and four, where that was where GPT three would fall over quite quickly, and GPT four seems to be able to go a few more steps before human intervention is required. Yeah, it does. It does seem like it. Um, yeah, I, I'm also curious to hear from you if you know, because since our original talk, uh, you've been talking to a lot of other experts and, and doing some research on your own. Uh, so I'm curious on your end if there's uh, anything that we talked about in the past that uh, you changed your mind on. Yeah, um, yeah. So we'll 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 have a synthesis episode after after this one where we'll, we'll I'll dig into a lot more of the timeline aspects. But just to speak um, at least briefly on on kind of the things I've seen, I think in terms of capabilities, I think GPT four has met my expectations but maybe more on the optimistic side um, at the end of the day you know it's it's easy to um, get into hyperbole uh, you know exaggeration with these things where you say oh well gpt4 is going to be you know more powerful than three and five is going to be more than four but it's a different thing when when it actually comes true you know it takes your probabilities to 100 percent. and in that sense um, the fact that gpt4 has been able to do some impressive things and that the broader um, developer community, the broader safety community have all looked at this and said, okay, this is really impressive and, and this is something we should pay a lot of attention to, has made it a lot more real. Um, other things, other more specific things like the yeah, multimodal capabilities, the larger um, token uh, inputs, so, so, uh, so which I, I believe we've talked about as well, like being able to ingest 32,000 rather than um, 2,000 odd um, tokens. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm starting to think about, I've been trying to think about what the the token ingestion represents in a cognition point of view. And it almost thinks, uh, it, it's something to me, like almost like working memory, that like really easily accessible, um, easily kind of framed sort of cognition um, as part of, of the next decision step. And yeah, it makes a big difference when you when you grow working memory. And we've seen that um, with, with the usefulness of GPT-4 over GPT-3. Yeah, I, I think that is potentially a, a, a good analogy. And like to your point, I, I don't think that humans, like I don't think the human brain has 32k tokens of working short-term memory it's probably much shorter than that uh, another way of thinking about it is uh, i think opening i have said that thirty-two thousand tokens is like 55 pages of text like that's a lot uh, i couldn't memorize 55 pages of text now maybe the human brain is is keeping other things that are more difficult i was going to say obviously text format in working we, memory yeah, that's we, possible exactly like for example obviously the human brain is dramatically better at spatial um, understanding. You know, we can keep maps maps of the entire world and and and, and kind of move through a space and, and process a lot of sensory input. So there are obviously things that we can do here um, that GPT-4 can't, but it does again show the increasing capabilities of these systems and how those capabilities can translate into real world tasks. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I want to touch quickly on um, how this has affected your timelines. Um, I believe, uh, I, I probably should have written this down, but I didn't. Um, I believe your predictions last time were on the order of, of many decades, you know, some things like, you know, 2040, 2050, 2060, on the order of magnitude. Um, how has this stuff changed 
your understanding of, of, of timelines to a future artificial general intelligence? Yeah, good question. So I actually went back and checked before I hopped on this call. And in the previous episode, I said, uh, you really put me on the spot. And I, I guessed uh, maybe there's a 50% chance of seeing AGI in 30 or 40 years. Um, so I think I, based on the news that I've seen so far and like the rapid pace of development, I think I would adjust that timeline to uh, sooner rather than later. But we're also at the point where it really, really matters what definition you're using for AGI because by some definitions, and I, I would say even reasonable definitions, uh, GPT-4 is, is already AGI. Um, and I think some of the benchmarks that we had in mind for, oh, once, once a, uh, uh, a model can do this, it means that we have AGI. Like some of those benchmarks are already getting hit. Um, I don't think that that means GPT-4 is as intelligent as a human at every task. Um, I think that's pretty clear that that's not the case. But uh, I guess the, the definition that we used in our, our previous episode was uh, that an AGI system can do most or all uh, economically useful tasks that a human could do. And really the question is starting to boil down to um, how effectively does a system need to do those tasks for it to be considered AGI? And what exactly do you mean by most? Is it 51%? Because if so, that's a dramatically lower threshold or is it like 99% and that's much higher? Um, so I think we're definitely at the point where we're the specifics of your definition matter a lot more than they did even like a year or two ago. Um, yeah, I, I think if, if I had to pick a time and, and use the same definition that we used last time, I think it's closer to a 50% chance that we'll see AGI in, in 10 years or like something along those lines. And that doesn't necessarily mean by that definition that AGI is smarter than humans quite yet, or that there's no economically useful work left for humans to do. Uh, it just means that a lot of the economically useful work that humans are doing today would be done by, a, by an AI system. Yeah. In the um, so firstly, thank you, yeah, for, for describing that. In the last episode um, with Ryan Coopin, we actually got into his his predictions were also long range, and the reason they were long range, at least one of them, was actually regulatory blockers. Um, some of those regulatory blockers relate to specifically to capabilities, like for example, can um, an organization like OpenAI continue to scrape information from the internet, or will that you know, fall under some sort of copyright protection in a way that, that slows them down. But some of them also relate just simply to what's allowed. You know, if you have something that's cognitively as capable or, you know, arguably as capable as a doctor or a lawyer, but then you say, no, you can't be or a doctor or a lawyer unless you're a human. Well, then you, you kind of artificially block that. Now, if we put that side, that part of it aside and say it's more assuming um, regulators were very open, open-minded and reasonable, and, and didn't put artificial blocks. Then could it do it? Yeah, I think something like what you're what you're describing, you know, ten years, fifty percent, seems sensible to me. Um, and I'll talk more about my detailed timelines next week, but uh, next next episode. But yes, I I think what you're saying makes a lot of sense, unless we hit some real major roadblocks. Um, there is one roadblock that I wonder if we will hit. Um, I'm not saying we will, but I, I wonder. Um, and it actually comes from Ilya, um, the chief scientist at OpenAI. Um, he spoke about if there was something that could um, uh, slow us down, it would actually, he thinks he wonders if it's going to be around reliability. So getting something to do 
80, 20, maybe potentially easier than getting it to work 99% of the time. Um, as we saw, for example, with self-driving cars and, and the difficulty of, of tackling the edge cases there. So that's one, one thing that I'm still thinking about. And I'll, I'll put a concrete opinion and a concrete prediction in my next episode. But, but I think your prediction of 10 years has a lot of merit. Yeah. And, and just to reiterate, by the way, like, don't take this prediction. Nobody should take this prediction at face value. Um, I think it is really hard to come up with accurate predictions, especially in AI where things are changing so rapidly. Uh, I'm not even the, the best expert to attempt to make a prediction. I think there are people that are more qualified than I am. But uh, I think the purpose of this podcast, a big part of it, is to try and uh, come up with something so that we can use it as a frame of reference and, and start thinking about uh, the impact. And uh, yeah, so. Just, just wanted to reiterate that. I completely agree. I actually, um, I don't know if I've ever said this live on the podcast, but, but I'll say it now very, yeah, it's exactly what Alex said. You know, the goal of, of this, when will AGI arrive, is actually not to pinpoint the exact year because that's both impossible and honestly, actually, well, I guess it would be useful, but it would be impossible to the point of, of being a foolish exercise. Um, the goal is actually to say, are we... Um, are we actually uh, dealing with the right problems on the right time scale? So if we if we think it's very few years, it would be a different set of actions to a few decades, which would be different to a few centuries. That's the real um, goal of this exercise. Yeah, yeah. And then specifically, I, I can comment about your point of reliability. This is also something that's been on my mind. Uh, and I, I watched the uh, Lex Friedman interview uh, with uh uh what was his name Ilya uh yeah I'm I'm struggling with his last name which ah, I, I forget his last myself. name it's it, yeah I'm not going to try I'll, I'll butcher it it's <laughs> nice. and he's a he's an incredible guy um uh, just just we're terrible at last names brilliant interview uh and I I definitely think there's a lot of uh I think he's right about that that like reliability is going to be a big part of the conversation moving forward. Um, it's also something I touched on briefly in my answer, which is like, what degree of accuracy counts as being as good at uh, as humans at economically useful tasks? Um, it could easily depend on the industry. Um, and yeah, you're right. Like we, we might reach a point where there are some industries and some tasks where, uh, 80% reliability is good enough, and we might re see others where uh, the reliability isn't good enough, and it could remain not good enough for a long time, potentially. Um, it's, it's hard to know. Mm. Uh, I think we've, we've talked about some of the latest developments and how they've affected your timeline, Alex. I think that's going to be good for our listeners to understand. Um, I think it's worth going just a little bit deeper, and, and you've written this really fantastic document kind of talking to all the things you've seen um, development wise. So maybe let's do what I'd call a fast round. So um, if you could just go through and say, here are all the developments and, and some key takeaways from each, I think that'd be really interesting to our listeners. And we'll try and keep the whole thing, you know, under, under 10, 15 minutes max. Um, but yeah, I think it's a really interesting point. And, and if there's really interesting discussion, maybe we'll pause on that one and dig a little bit further. But um, yeah, so Maybe fast around all the developments you've seen since uh, since about four months ago. Yeah, sounds good. And I mean, four months ago is an eternity in the AI space. <laughs> so there's so many things that have changed. Which uh, in and of itself is actually an interesting indicator that four months, that, that tells you something about the slope, you know, and that it's it's moving quickly. So unless you expect that flattening of that slope, you know, even basic linear extrapolation, much less super linear extrapolation tells you that we're expecting to see quite major developments in the next uh, decades. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, cool, so I'm gonna look at some of my notes here and then uh, we'll go through. Um, probably the biggest place to start is uh, GPT-4 was released. Uh, I should caveat this with the fact that I, I don't have access to GPT-4 myself yet. Uh, I'm still on the waitlist. So I think it is important to take 
any of the claims uh, and especially any of the cherry picked examples that you might see uh, on YouTube or on Twitter uh, to take those with a grain of salt. Um, but that said, like it looks like the capabilities of GPT-4 are really impressive. Um, I was particularly impressed with the bar exam results. So GPT-4 was, uh, according to OpenAI, able to pass the bar exam uh, in the top 10% of uh, human test takers compared to GPT-3.5, which is in the bottom 10%. Uh, that's a big difference. It's also a test that I think is less likely to be impacted by uh, direct contamination in the training set. But assuming that they used a more recent uh, version of the bar exam, like one from 2023 or uh, 2022, potentially, as long as it was after the training data cutoff, like those questions would, would not appear verbatim in the training set, which I think is we might be a little bit less certain about that for some of the other uh, evaluation metrics. Yes, I can say a little bit about that as well. Um, just on that point, um, a few few things. Um, firstly, um, OpenAI's paper speaks specifically talks about removing verbatim um, uh, matches. So they do a, a search in for for um, exact substring matches. They they do some removal. Um, also, uh, there was a different paper from Microsoft where they did, I believe, a medical exam where the medical exam was behind a paywall and therefore not in the training set and, and, and GPT-4 still did very, very well there. So there's some examples on paywalled um, exams. And then finally, even if we say this is a, a case of training contamination, the fact that GPT-3.5 scored in the bottom 10% and GPT-4 scored in the top 10%, unless the difference there is a training set, which I'm not aware of any evidence that it was a training set difference, um, then something interesting is happening. Even if this is just, it is able to go slightly deeper cognitively that takes it from bottom 10% to top 10% in, in an exam uh, that's similar to something in training set, something cognitively has, has changed here. So. Um, that's still quite impressive, and and we should we should note, you know, humans obviously practice with practice exams. You know, nobody goes blind into the uh, to the bar bar exam, you know, uh, and expects to do well there either. So, you know, apples to apples comparisons as well. Yeah, good point. Good point. Um, yeah, so they they also showed how GPT four was able to pass um, the LSAT, SAT, GRE, uh, a bunch of different AP courses, and we should take these claims with a grain of salt, um, but I, I bring this up because like, this is one of the benchmarks that have been proposed in the past for AGI systems, is specifically like, can they uh, pass a, a college exam? Um, I think you could argue that this isn't what the benchmark creator had in mind. Um, and maybe a better test would be if you could somehow have GPT-4 uh, sit down and read a textbook uh, for something that's never for a topic that has never been exposed to. Um, but yeah, I, I, I just want to bring it up because we're we're already at the point where the precise definitions and, and how you define certain benchmarks for AGI matter a lot and. If you define it a certain way, like GPT-4 is already there, which, which is interesting and surprising. So one thing that I think was really uh, fascinating is that in the uh, appendix, I, I believe, for the GPT-4 paper, they talk about how uh, ARC, the Alignment Research Center, was able to use GPT-4 to uh, recruit a human on TaskRabbit to solve a CAPTCHA. So GPT-4 was tasked with like using TaskRabbit uh, through, I, I assume, some kind of like uh, uh, DSL uh, where GPT-4 can say like, hey, ask this question or, uh, you know, send this to the human on the other end. And by, by DSL uh, there, we just mean some, some interface between, between TaskRabbit and, and, and the AI model. Yeah, exactly. Because as a reminder, GPT-4 just output text, outputs text. It can't directly uh, send a request over the internet or something. But if you just add a little bit of code on top, then you can facilitate that. Um, and basically, GPT-4 uh, 
was able to convince the human to solve a CAPTCHA. The human asked, uh, are you a robot? And GPT-4 was asked to reason out loud and it, it reasons, uh, I, I should not reveal that I am a robot. I should make up an excuse for why I can't solve CAPTCHAs. And then, so it doesn't say that to the human. Then it says to the human, no, I'm not a robot. I have a vision impairment that makes it hard for me to see the images. And the human said, that makes sense. And they solved the caption and they, they responded back with the solution. So I think this is interesting for a lot of reasons. It shows that if you ask GPT-4 to reason uh, out loud, it can, or, or at least convincingly appears to have some kind of reasoning ability and is even able to deceive humans on the other side of conversations. Uh, I, I just thought that was pretty fascinating. Oh, absolutely. And and, and um, concrete examples of deception are really important because deception is one of the, the ways we think future AI models could be quite problematic if they say one thing but actually believe another um, with, their, with their human operators. And this is a very concrete documented example of deception. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, okay, so talking a little bit more about GPT-4, I, I want to mention a, another paper uh, that came out, uh, published by Microsoft Research, is called "The Sparks of General Intel." Uh, sorry, Sparks of General Artificial Intelligence. Uh, let, let me make sure I get that exact title right. Yeah, Sparks of Artificial General Intelligence: uh, Early Experiments with GPT-4. Uh, were you going to say something? No, no, no. I was just going to say we'll, we'll put it in the show links. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, so in the paper, uh, they the, the thing that I find most fascinating is that they show how GPT-4 can use tools. Um, and so what that means is like, GPT-3 was notoriously bad at math. And that was actually one of the things that we talked about in our previous podcast episode, where uh, it, it would just get mathematical reasoning wrong uh, or fail to answer simple mathematical word problems. And one thing that's fascinating about GPT-4 is that if you, in, in your prompts, you explain that um, GPT-4 can use a calculator, uh, and if it wants to use the calculator, or this is just an example, you say uh, it needs to respond in its uh, output with like calc and then in parentheses, like the whatever calculation it wants to do. Uh, so basically with, with very little setup, you can explain to GPT-4 that it has a calculator available to it. And the researchers showed that it's able to make decisions about when it needs to use the calculator and then use it effectively to solve certain problems. Um, and not just a calculator, it, it can run arbitrary code. Um, other research has shown that it can send requests to the internet, uh, do things like access long-term memory to kind of work around the token limit, which is already quite large. So I think it's really fascinating because it shows that GPT-4 has the potential to uh, address some of its own weaknesses if you give it the tools to do so. And, and it can learn how to use those tools apparently very easily uh, without too much effort. Yep, absolutely. And and it should be noted that that paper was about 150 pages long and uh, their conclusion out of you know running all of these different kind of benchmarks and, and tests with GPT-4 was that this should qualify um, as, as some sort of weak artificial general intelligence, which is quite interesting for, for a, a number of researchers uh, with a lot of experience who had access to the full GPT-4 model to, to claim. Now, I guess we should call out, there's a little bit of conflict of interest there. Microsoft has some things to gain um, from, from, from making their systems look more impressive than they are. With that said, Microsoft Research is a, is a well-respected uh, research organization. So I wouldn't say that they would do that necessarily lightly either though. Yeah, excellent point. And I think the number of researchers that have access to GPT-4 is growing every day. And so if, if there was some kind of, 
huge mistake or a large amount of cherry picking of the data that's happening, like it would become apparent really quickly. Um, so let's keep an eye on it, but I, I tend to believe that this is the, the claims made in the paper and the, the specific examples are probably in the right ballpark. Um, yep, and they do go out of their way to to uh, discuss limitations of GPT-4 as well. So they clearly have, have put in some work to making this a balanced take as well. Yeah, definitely. And and some of the limitations that I talked about are uh, like generating text with constraints. So like, for example, I, I think the example was they used was like write a poem, but use the same sentence for the first sentence and the last sentence. Um, I've seen other people ask questions along the same lines of like, answer this question with exactly 25 words. And the reason that GPT-4 is bad at, at these kinds of problems is that um, it requires kind of knowing what the answer is before you start writing the answer. And GPT-4 never had to do that during training. Like mostly it, it just cares about predicting the very next token. Um, you could argue that it has some ability to th think ahead, but clearly there are limitations to its ability to think ahead. Yeah, and I wonder. Um, yeah, I wonder if how, how those those things feel solvable with with the right types of ML techniques. Well, uh, it's interesting that you ask because I, I think one way to address this is with uh, reflection. So there's a different research paper that that came out that talks about this uh, idea of reflection, um, and basically all that means is when GPT-4 comes up with a, uh, an answer, you just ask it something along the lines of, um, are you sure that answer was correct? Or is there anything wrong about your previous response? And if so, can you correct it? Right, so you just ask these kind of, not necessarily leading questions because it, it could always say, no, there's nothing wrong. Um, but you basically just ask it to double check its own responses. and if you do that, this, this relatively simple thing, it apparently improves performance for certain kinds of tasks uh, dramatically. So uh, they looked at the human eval uh, metrics, which is something that uh, OpenAI talked about a lot uh, and used in their examples. And they showed that for zero, zero shot accuracy, so without any examples in the prompt itself, uh, it increased from 67% to 88.4%. And apparently then after the paper was published, the author uh, went back and said that they were able to see further improvements up to 91%. So like, this is a paper that was published uh, last week, I think. And then a few days later, the author said, oh, actually we were able to improve it even further. Um, so that's, pretty surprising and and kind of the i'm just surprised by the rate of uh improvement and and also the ability of uh the fact that with a little bit of uh, prompt tuning and, and some some basic tricks you can improve performance so much it, it makes me think that we haven't unlocked the full potential of gpt4 yet exactly no i completely agree with that and i think it also tells us you know Cognition is not just about the neural net weights, you know, the model itself, but also how the model then is used and interact with its own inputs and outputs, you know, and, and we have a very good analogy of this with, which is with humans. Like, you know, you take a human who has never um, learned a new skill or, I mean, that's probably uh, not a reasonable thing, but you take a human that has never gone through education and then you take a human that's gone through education and we use so many um, mental tricks and, and rules of thumb and, and, and types of reasoning and, 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 and uh, stuff that we write down and tools to, to kind of enhance our cognition. And in the same way, we're seeing even just within you know, days and weeks of these things released, people showing pretty dramatic improvements in, in the capabilities of these models. So. I think um, as we see people build on top of these LLMs, we should also expect the capabilities of these LLMs to go up quite significantly. Um, 
Yeah, maybe that's a good segue also into auto GPT and hugging GPT, uh, which which actually is a, a little bit of a version of this. Do you want to go into those, Alex? Yeah, so I have to admit that these tools are brand new. I, I haven't had time to play around with them personally, um, but they look very exciting. Um, not to mention, since I don't have access to GPT-4 yet, I, I wouldn't be able to unlock the full uh, capabilities of these tools anyways. Um, so basically, uh, auto GPT and, and hugging GPT, they have slightly different approaches, but they're both setting up uh, GPT-4 or chat GPT to serve as high-level controllers to uh, do all kinds of things. So they can use tools, look things up on the internet, save and read files. Um, they can call out to other uh, AIs. In some cases, like there's an overarching uh, GPT-4 pilot that can create new prompts and call out to other GPT agents to help solve specific sub problems. So basically like you lay out a complicated multi-task, uh, multi-step problem and GPT-4, or, or sometimes in some cases, ChatGPT, is able to break it up into smaller pieces and figure out which tools it needs to solve which specific piece, and then chain everything together without any human intervention. Um, I was really kind of blown away by this. Like I said, in our original podcast episode, I, I didn't think that large language models were the key to AGI, I was thinking them of them more as a tool, like a small piece of the puzzle that some AGI system might use for language related tasks. But it's actually starting to look like um, a sufficiently powerful LLM can serve as the main autonomous agent part of uh, an AGI, or like the main executive and, and problem solving part which I think is really fascinating to see. Yes, yes. Both these types of experiments and also the Palm E um, experiment from Google kind of show us that yeah, this can be the executive reasoning and, and it can process new types of information, not even just language, um, to help uh, to move through the world as an agent. Um, so this is interesting and, and a little bit scary, I must admit, um, for a couple of reasons. One, yeah, one being... The capabilities, you know, that it can be executive function. Um, the in the Auto GPT um, GitHub page, they talk about, you know, could this thing be the CEO of an organization? You know, could this thing run an app by itself? Um, and I saw uh, one of the um, most prominent AI safety researchers who actually works at OpenAI, uh, Richard No, uh, tweet with some predictions for the end of 2025, where he. Uh, one of his predictions was that a AI will be able to both create, publish, and and maintain an app, like you know, the follow the distribution of a of a, of a new app um, end to end um, by the end of 2025, which is a pretty bold prediction from someone who knows a lot about OpenAI internals. So um, it, it's interesting from the from the capabilities perspective, and then scary from a um, risks and challenges perspective that we may, we will likely have people happily uh, do that, happily release uh, agents into the world um, if there are not other checks and balances. You know, we have, even with the limited release of GPT-4, we already have people um, uh, using these as autonomous agents. And um, I think that has very, very real implications for, for the future of our world that we'll, we'll talk about in future episodes. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Uh, and, and to be clear, like I expect that tools like AutoGPT and Hugging GPT are far from perfect. Um, I think that they will probably have a tendency to make mistakes and, and not be able to solve certain problems. But the fact that we're here today um, and we're just barely starting to put these things together and you can kind of see how they work is, is really, uh, uh, I mean, it's a big deal, I think. Absolutely. And 
And uh, I want to be clear, like those kind of what's possible questions are, don't even necessarily require more tech major inventions and breakthroughs. So I'll give you a concrete example. You know, when the first uh, computer, you know, the first transistors were put together, it couldn't do very much. You know, you probably had some like really, really, really simple logic gates, you know, a really simple summation, these kinds of very elementary operations. And simply by scaling those elementary operations up and stringing them together and making them smaller and um, cheaper, which are, of course, a type of innovation, but they're not massive breakthrough type innovations. They're more sustaining type incremental innovations. We've, we've gotten to you know, really massive computing systems that still rely on those same basic elementary operations. And in the same way, I imagine you take something like an LLM and just give it a lot of time to do things um, and, and give it a lot of autonomy, give it, you know, make it a little bit smaller, make it a little bit um, faster, make it a little less um, power and cost uh, efficient. And I think we will see some really, really um, big capabilities and, and, and outcomes that we don't fully understand at this stage. Yeah, definitely, definitely. I think that'll be a healthy place to, to stop with the summarization of, of some of the latest developments. Um, I think this has been a fantastic um, explanation of things that have evolved in the last four months, especially with the release of, of GPT-4 um, and how that's affected you know, both of our thinking um, towards AGI timelines. Um, we'll actually make this the last episode on timelines, I think. Um, between this conversation and the many others we've had, I think we've got a good sense of timelines and pathways, and it's time to go a little bit deeper into uh, implications and responses. So with our future episodes, we'll, we'll start to talk to experts who both are thinking about the future implications and how we might best respond. Um, with that, I just want to say thank you to Alex for your fantastic explainers and, and, and for giving your honest opinions, which is all we ask. And thank you to our, to our listeners as well. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you, Suresh.